quite what will happen. So it's my great pleasure to introduce to you tonight, uh, Professor Ulf Wulfgen. He's Professor of Environmental Systems Analysis at the Department of Geography in Cambridge, and he's Head of Tree Ring Unit and Director of the Master of Philosophy in Holocene Climates. He was born in Germany, but then moved to um, Switzerland, where he worked for a while, uh, for 14 years, and he still maintains um, a connection there where he's senior scientist at the Swiss Federal Research Institute for Forest, Snow and Landscape. He's also involved in a Czech project um, where he's professor of physical geography at the Department of Geography and Moraski University. So it's my great pleasure to welcome Professor Ulf Bulken, and we will be taking questions at the end of the session. And if you'd like to write them into the question and answer, I will facilitate this at the end. Uh, the chat is disabled, um, so please use the question and answer. Thank you, Professor Bunken. Uh, <clears throat> Let's see if that works. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, that's fine. And you see the next slide, right? Yes, I see the slide. Okay. That's okay. fine. So thank, th thank you very much for the uh, kind introduction. Yes, I would have uh, preferred to come in person to, to Edinburgh, but it was just uh, uh, not, it, it was easier like this. And I, uh, I do apologize if there are any inconvenience, but uh, we keep it as it is. So uh, I will spend the next 45, 50 minutes maximum uh, on talking a little bit about tree rings. I call it in praise of tree ring archives uh, and an open dendrochronological mind. So uh, you see it's tree ring research. We maybe also call it dendrochronology. It's about archives and it's about a constant curiosity driven open approach of uh, finding uh, new things out that are hidden in this uh, various triggering parameters. More specifically, I will talk about four ongoing, let's say, research frontiers, fields where my group uh, and, and my colleagues are uh, engaged in, where we try to find new answers and uh, improve the, the field, isotopic variation, lignin formation, tree line fluctuation, and annual resolution. Before we go into these four yeah, uh, topics, I want to start with a little bit of a background about the, the field of dendrochronology, tree ring research. And uh, I thought maybe the easiest, or we should start with a very easy question, apparently an easy one, what is a tree? Uh, and yeah, if one does it then in person in an audience, it's it's a little bit nicer than online, I know that. But so the first question would be, what is a tree? And, and everyone would immediately think, have something in mind. Um, you see this picture here. I took that a couple of years ago uh, in coastal East Greenland. So we are looking out to the North Atlantic. And uh, the question is, what, what is a tree ring researcher doing up there? High in, uh, in the north, in the northern latitudes, far above the northern tree line. And if we turn around and look inland, the picture is not changing a lot. So it took us quite some time to, to figure out what are we actually doing here. And if you look a little bit closer into these rocks here, for instance, here, here, and then now I move over with the with some mouse here, you see a little bit of vegetation. Let's call it vegetation, it's green. Um, yeah, and then we found something. There is a scale, as a geographer, we are used to work with scale. So I would say, uh, assume without these fingers here that are fingers from uh, Professor Schweingruber, some of you might know him, a botanist also, uh, Fritz Schweingruber. So, now we get a feeling for the size, but we also see there is a canopy, there is a stem, there is a root system. So from a morphological perspective, we could not distinguish this small plant from something you may just a couple of minutes earlier had in mind when I asked you, what is a tree? 
now you may come and say, yeah, but aren't dendrochronologists aiming for age? Aren't they looking for old plants? And we cut the stem and we counted almost 240 annual growth rings. So this little uh, small dendron uh, laponicum from, uh, uh, from the east coast of Greenland is 240 years old. And we cannot distinguish it morphologically, anatomically, and also physiologically from a bigger tree that you may uh, have in your garden. So I think that is an interesting one, and it should come a little bit as a surprise. So all I want to say is we should question, or maybe we should question the life form classification between trees, shrubs, dwarf shrubs, herbs. And I'm saying that a little bit provocative because the whole field is called tree ring research. And if we are restricting ourselves or the other way around, if we are opening our perspective, uh, our research field also to much smaller plants that can be very old and actually have fulfilled the same function than bigger ones, uh, we, we can open a, a huge range of new frontiers where, where new questions arise. Okay, that was just a loop. So what is a tree is not that trivial. And we as dendrochronologists should be very open in how we, or what we consider just to, to have a broader field to explore. What we are also doing more recently is we are integrating wood anatomy or wood anatomical techniques into dendrochronology. And uh, this is an example. We are looking at the same piece of wood from three different directions and we see something different, though it's the same piece of wood. If we apply a cross-sectioning, so that is a normal way, just a cross-section of a stem, then we see the ringwood pattern. Then we can also add a radial section and a tangential section, and all three of them basically provide a comprehensive, a more comprehensive, a more complete insight into wood anatomical structures. This is important for species identification. This is used, or we use it when we bridge over, for instance, to archaeology, when it's about understanding and defining species from old wooden remains. Next slide shows us a complete, so we are approaching now the principles of dendrochronology more and more. Next slide here shows us a picture of one complete annual growth ring. So I'm using the mouse now, um, th this here, these are the early wood cells. So they are formed at the beginning of the growing season, large cells, thin cell walls. They mainly have the, uh, the function to transport water and nutrients from the root system throughout the stem up into the canopy and backwards. So there is an, a, a daily cycle. And if the tree wood only consists of the early wood, so the large cells with the relatively thin cell walls that are formed at the beginning of the growing season, tree wouldn't be able to grow really fast, so it needs more stability. And that's why towards the end of the growing season, here on the right side, the cells are getting smaller, so that is the so-called late wood, and the cell walls are getting thicker. So this part, which is then formed towards the end of the growing season, so from summer into autumn, higher lignification rates. Uh, this is responsible for the stability of a stem. So instead of just looking into one ring, so understanding intra-annual growth dynamics, so cytogenesis, so the level of wood anatomy, the dendrochronologists are interested in understanding interannual, so year-to-year -year fluctuations. And now if I would ask you how many completed rings do you see here? Yeah, many people would say hmm, one, two, three. You also know if I'm asking like this, maybe there is a small challenge. So one, two, a very, very thin ring, just consisting of one or even two or maximum two early wood cells and one late wood cell. Third, 
and a fourth ring. So four complete rings. And this very narrow ring here, this has been induced by an insect defoliation, but it could also be a response to very harsh climate conditions. This is always a dilemma to disentangle the different factors that can overlap and cause the same uh, anomaly in, in, in growth. Next slide shows three different oak sections, pieces. So wood pieces from three different oaks and your eyes will immediately focus on these so-called pointer years on very distinct growth anomalies that help us to cross date. So this is the principle of dendrochronology, building annually resolved and absolutely dated time series. So the principle is that we are starting with the living trees here on the right side. So if we take a sample, if we cut the tree, if we have a disc, or if we extract the core sample, which doesn't do any harm to the tree, um, and we have the outermost ring with the bark on, then we know the year of sample extraction or felling, the calendar year. This is important. And then we can count back the years and we use many trees to cross dates and internally to be sure that the calendar is correct. And then we depend or we look for overlapping samples, relic samples, maybe from historical construction wood or from a subfossil material that is somehow deposited in a gravel pit or on a peat bog, or maybe uh, carried by a glacier. And that allows us to develop very long, but always absolutely dated and very precise time series of growth. The next step would be to understand the climate signal. So there are two examples here. The one on the left side is a picture uh, that represents a more um, arid environment. You see there's almost no understory. These are very big trees. Here is another scale. Here is a colleague standing. So these are uh, Cedros Atlantica trees in the Atlas Mountains in Morocco. They can reach ages of more than 1,000 years. If we would consider this part of North Af Africa, the Mediterranean as part of Europe, these would be the oldest trees in Europe. And we can use them to reconstruct hydroclimate, or more specifically, changes in soil moisture availability. So it's not directly rainfall that uh, affects the growth of these trees. It's more the amount of water that is stored in the soil, which is somehow related relatively closely to precipitation, but not only. So you have to think if you keep the amount of rainfall precipitation constant, but just make it warmer or cooler. This will result excuse me, in more or less uh, drier or wetter conditions. And uh, so you see, when we talk about hydroclimate, it's always a little bit tricky because it's a combination of precipitation, of temperature, but also of uh, soil conditions. So these trees would be proxies. So climate archives, to tell us something about, for instance, changes in the North Atlantic oscillation over the past thousand years. If we go to the right example here, this is a picture uh, taken in the Swiss, in a Swiss inner Alpine Valley, so-called Lötschental. You can see the picture uh, was taken in autumn. You see that first of all, you have a fresh snow line here. We are at the upper tree line. The upper tree line species or the tree line is formed by Larix decidua. You see these trees have nicely already changed the needle color into brownish. So it's what some people would even call like an Indian summer. It's beautiful. And these trees, um, in contrast to these um, hydroclimatic sensitive trees, these trees uh, record very accurately small changes in growing season temperature. So we have to know which trees do we include in a dendrochronological study? What is the climate signal? Okay, this was a little bit an overview about the principles of tree ring research, dendrochronology. What is a tree and um, what is cross-dating? How can we implement um, 
techniques of wood anatomy into dendrochronology and how important is site selection and signal detection. Now, since you are all experts anyways, uh, I want to go into these four topics a little bit and show you where are we currently basically trying to get our heads around and moving the discipline together with other subdisciplines. First topic, isotopic variation. So, so far I just talked about ring widths, maybe a little bit of wood density. So when you, when I showed you the intra-annual profile from the early to the late wood, and now I'm engaging with another parameter, so-called treeing stable isotopes, oxygen and carbon. Now the next slide, that's also the only one for today is a little bit wordy, so I apologize for that, but I think we still have to do that because it's the, the topic is not that simple and it needs a little bit of background information. But as promised, this is the only wordy uh, texty slide of the whole presentation. There will be many more pictures later on. So whenever, it's now important, I have to we, I talk us through, whenever the concept of gross limiting factors, like gross dependent tree ring parameters, is used to reconstruct past climate or environmental conditions, information, so climate information, on very long time scales, far beyond the lifespan of individual trees or specimens, is most likely missing. So that means that if we are using tree ring widths, maximum late wood density, so the traditional tree ring parameters, aiming to reconstruct, for instance, temperature changes over the Holocene, over the past 12,000 years, by combining different wood sources, we would not be able to capture, if there are, these very long-term trends. Because, so next uh, section, plant growth mainly depends on the availability of nutrients, carbon dioxide, and light, as well as adequate amounts of water and warmth temperature. So it needs to be warm and wet. There needs to be enough light. Of these growth controlling factors, at least one, only one, constraints the growth rate, the survival rate of perennial plants at their species specific distribution limit. So this is Liebig's law. So there is an upper tree line, there is a northern tree line, and these distribution limits are species specific. For instance, small temperature changes during the growing season, so summer temperatures, can affect the widths, the density, and the anatomy of tree rings near the upper elevational, so the upper alpine or arctic poleward tree line. We know that, and that's exactly what we do. We go to northern Scandinavia, we go to the uh, Swiss Alps take samples from these trees to reconstruct small changes in summer temperature variability. Now we have to make an experiment, a theoretical, just thinking. If surface temperatures, so the globe, would hypothetically increase over very long periods of time, so it's getting warmer and warmer and warmer, but at the same time, no other constraint would arise. So it's not getting drier, just getting warmer and warmer. So the growing conditions are continuously improving. This would not result in a wider and wider and wider ring. So it's not that if we increase the growth conditions, that at one point we would have a ring that is one meter wide. And in turn, if we make the growth conditions weaker and weaker, it would also not result in a negative growth ring. No, what would change are biogeographic distribution patterns and physiological survival requirements over long periods of time. So the principle of phenotypic plasticity and genetic adaptation 
implies a biological boundary for trearing-based climate reconstructions. That is usually, or that is not considered so far. Now, the independence between signal and proxy, so these would be gross independent parameters, which is not the case for ring widths and wood density, they are gross dependent, but these independent ones are tree ring stable isotopes. Okay, so what we see here are two relatively newly published climate reconstructions. The upper one from Central Europe, it's a summer hydroclimate reconstructions over more than 2000 years. So basically from Roman times towards present. And the lower one is a six and a half thousand year long hydroclimate reconstruction or a reconstruction of Asian monsoon variability for Central Asia. And what we see in both of these totally independent though treeing, based on treeing stabilized top records are these long-term trends. So it's getting drier over the Holocene. So this independent evidence from Europe and Asia shows that tree-ring stable isotopes can reveal persistent long-term climate trends that are usually not reflected in ring widths and wood density. This is very, very important, and this is new. The observed long-term discrepancy between the generally flatter growth dependent, so ring widths, density, and possibly more varying growth independent, like stable isotopes, climate proxy data, is unrelated to the statistical removal of age trends. And what it does, it calls for a conceptual rethinking of the predictive power of different treeing parameters in climate reconstructions. This is particularly challenging, that is a lower sentence, if information from different proxy archives is combined in so-called multi-proxy approaches. And that is where the field is moving. So combining evidence, data, information from different proxy archives, merging them and putting them in one final reconstruction. And if we now know or get a feeling that some of the archives can and the others cannot preserve information on different timescales, we have to be very cautious. Okay, I know this was very theoretical, but I also think this is the right audience here to see the field is becoming critical with itself. We know there are certain parameters that have an advantage over the other, vice versa. And we have to be very cautious if we are combining information from these different archives. It's not that one is better than the other, but we have to be extremely transparent and reflective on what can be combined and what can we expect. So if we are using ring widths, maximum late wood density, which is accounting for, I would say 90, 80, 85, 90% of all of the available reconstructions from the dendrochronological community, we cannot expect to have these long-term information included. This becomes more and more important since our chronologies are getting longer and longer reaching further back in time. However, uh, the extraction and the measurement of tree stable isotopes could be a way forward. Okay, next topic, lignin formation. So what you see here, schematic figure of a slope, an elevational gradient. So we have tree growth, shrub growth, trees are getting smaller and smaller, and then there is something what we call a tree line. So it is a cold range limit of the life form tree. Okay, what the life form tree is, you know that now, that's not that clear, but commonly taller, upright growing plants are stopping to grow if it's getting too cold. What we see then here is also the lower we are, so the better the growth conditions are, the wider are the rings. The rings are getting narrower and narrower, plants are getting smaller, if we increase in elevation, so when it's getting colder. And what we then see here is the occurrence of so-called blue rings. You see, 
if we take a piece of the xylem, the wood, we stain it with astra blue and safranin, the thin section, it would turn red. Everything that is lignified becomes red. And then if we are approaching the tree line, there is a chance that very, very occasionally, very rarely, we see a so-called blue ring, a ring in which some of the cells, usually the late wood cells, are not lignified. And then if we even go further, if we go beyond the tree line and take samples from very small plants, draw shrubs or even herbs, sometimes they are almost not lignified at all. So what we did, we collected samples from trees, from shrubs, from draw shrubs, from herbs, all over the globe. Importantly, we took stem sections of all of these different life forms at the root collar or very close to the root collar. We then selected a sample out of the xylem, so excluding um, the cambium and bark to have comparable material. And this is how the data set looks. So it's, we would call it almost a global coverage. So we have samples from almost all continents. These are the black ones. And in green, there are reference points from the same species. And now what we did, we produced thin sections and defined the degree of cell wall lignification. So that means we can have a sample that turns to be very red, or we can have a sample that turns out to be very blue after double staining with astra blue and safranine. And then here we plotted plant height, so very small plants up to very tall trees and the degree of cell wall lignification very low. So that means relatively blue to very high, almost completely red. And what we see is for the tall plants, they are always red. So there is no upright growing tall tree uh, that has non-lignified non cells, but there are many small plants, draw shrubs and herbs that can have a wide range of either lignif lignified or non-lignified cell walls. And that uh, reminds us to the sample I showed you very uh, at, at the very beginning, the small rhododendron laponicum. You remember when I then asked you how old is it or wouldn't we need very old material? You remember the sample comes from North uh, 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 Coastal East Greenland. So very far above the Northern tree line. And you remember the thin section I showed you that stained mainly blue and there's almost no lignin in this sample. So this is an example, a very nice example of a small plant growing far beyond the northern tree line under extremely cold conditions. It's creeping on the surface. It's not growing upright and it's basically not lignified. So when we are now taking the entire data set and just stay here in the upper line, that's where all data are combined. So it's in the A panel in the upper line. We have the degree of cell wall lignification from small to high, and we plot that against temperature at the site, site condition. And then we see there is a very nice relationship. So the colder the site conditions are, so the colder the growing conditions are, the less, or there is a tendency that these plants growing under cold conditions have less lignified cell walls. If it's getting warmer, it's the other way around. If we now plot the data set according to elevation, we see the same thing. So the higher we go in elevation, which also means if we are going to colder environments, there is a drop in cell wall lignification. And we can also plot the data according to uh, the geographic position, latitude, so pole walls, uh, obviously, we have more samples in the northern hemisphere uh, pole walls, and then we see, for instance, this year would be then a Greenland sample, basically very high in uh, northern latitude and almost no cell wall lignification. So what the argument we are bringing here is that we are plotting this global data set and comparing it 
with the position of the tree line, which is going reaching the pole, uh, re reaching sea level towards the poles and reaching the highest elevation um, in the high mountain systems of Inner Asia. We say that this, the lack or the temperature induced lack of cell wall lignification should be considered as a potential cause of the tree line position, of the global tree line position. So if it's getting too cold and plants lose their ability to lignify their secondary cell walls, they simply cannot ensure upright growth. And that's why we don't find trees above a certain level. Now um, I'm using a space, a, a time for space surrogate. So while we are so far looked into space, so how are different uh, wood anatomical structures changing if we go in warmer and colder environments, different places on Earth, we are now looking in time and maybe we find something similar. So the ring I'm showing you here is a so-called frost ring. This is a very famous picture. You know, dendrochronology can do one thing, it can count and it can tell very precisely in which calendar year a certain ring is formed. So this frost ring, in a second I will explain you, I will tell you what a frost ring is. This anatomical feature anomaly was formed in the year 536. So almost 1,500 years ago, 536. That was to our knowledge, the coldest summer of the last 2000 years, following a large volcanic eruption or maybe even a cluster of large volcanic eruptions. So this is the previous year ring. So this is a ring 535, a complete nice ring, early wood, late wood, then we have the late wood form, then we have dormancy, the next growing season starts, 536. Again, nice early wood cells, around one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five early wood cells. The sample comes from Mongolia, inner Eurasia. And then what happened? So approximately a couple of weeks or a month into the growing season, and the growing season there starts around May, June. So we are in early summer. What happened is, a very abrupt, rapid cooling, a very severe cooling, so that the water that the plant was already conducting from the uh, roots into the canopy in the early wood cells froze, expanded, and then when thawing, so when it got warmer after this cold spell, uh, the cell walls collapsed, the structure. That's basically the same when you put a bottle of... Um, whatever you like to drink into your freezer, you forget it overnight. Next day you come and um, yeah, the champagne uh, fro frozen and the bottle uh, collapsed. That's what we see here. This is a so-called frost ring. This ring uh, dates 536. I told you that you don't see anything about blue here, right? So what, what is the case here about uh, lignification? This is a normal sample, not double stained. So what we just did, we thought we have a better look into this. So to what we think the coldest year of the coldest summer of the last 2000 years. And we developed this global data set of wood anatomical samples. So everywhere where you see a symbol here, either high elevation, the so triangles, middle latitudes, or lower elevation, but then northern tree line, these sites are all temperature sensitive. We have sites in northern Siberia, in inner Eurasia, in Europe. We also have sites on the southern hemisphere, Tasmania, uh, New Zealand, and uh, Chilean Andes, North America, Quebec, uh, then here Colorado and the Sierra Nevada, and up to Alaska. So, and we develop these thin sections. We get a whole catalog of hundreds and hundreds of wood anatomical images. And we see, so this is our time for space surrogate. We see that there is an unusual occurrence of blue rings and frost rings and light rings just 
in the year 536. So another completely independent line of evidence that if temperatures are dropping below a certain threshold, which we don't know yet, trees seem or plants seem to be not able or their lignification process seems to be disrupted. And what we can do then if we have such a data set now, we can look into the different sites. So we have these 20 sites uh, that show wood anatomical features. We can see and uh, understand their growing season lengths, which are all different. We can see uh, how are the certain species responding to it with the ultimate goal. And I just do that quickly uh, to maybe develop an archive, an annually resolved and absolutely dated archive that reaches back uh, in this case, 1,500 years, and tells us about the traveling waves of post-volcanic cold spells. So basically to see, is a certain region affected more or less? Is a cold spell reaching a certain area before another? Okay, next example, tree line fluctuations. This is a picture I took yeah, almost 20 years ago. I think it's a beautiful picture to illustrate what we call the tree line, the upper tree line. Picture is, uh, this is uh, in uh, Slovakia. So on the southern, what we, you see here is a southern slope of the Tatra Mountains, of the high Tatra Mountains. On the other side, just on the other side is Poland. And you see this beautiful line here. This is what we call a tree line. Another picture here that is very recently, it's from last winter, also from the Carpathian uh, arc, but from Romania, again, there is our tree line. But now if you look here on the left side, yeah, where is that line? So another question of scale from far distance, one would say this is more or less a line, but then we obviously know when we get closer and closer, it's very difficult to say, where is this line? That's why we often use the term ecotone. But in any case, we see without human impact, if it's getting colder, and that is the only thing that is changing along an elevational slope here or here, it's just getting cooler. On average, uh, we see that the upright uh, or the life form tree is stopping to reach higher elevations. These are three very nice examples of tree line ecotones, one in the Western US, Bristol cone pines, another one on the Tibetan plateau, Kilian juniper, and then a totally different one in inner uh, uh, central um, inner Eurasia. This is the Altai mountain range uh, at the border between Siberia, Russia, and uh, Mongolia. Now, the point I want to make, as we said, I asked you earlier, uh, what is a tree? Tree ring research, people look Usually, the majority, 95% uh, of the tree ring researchers look at trees. And only a very small fraction is actually also looking at herbs and shrubs and smaller plants. And this is a very new movement to open our mind and perspective. The so same here. Tree ring, tree line research is so far as basically all tree line papers that you can read people looked at the tree line. Okay, but where's the problem? The problem is that whenever you look and you do research at the tree line, you are not really at what we consider the thermally induced tree line because there is a difference between the realized and the potential tree line. On the upper example here, these bristle cone pines are on average 400 years old. So that means this place here, this tree line, was formed 400 years ago. That's when these trees started to grow. So they represent climate or environmental conditions from 400 years ago. Today, it's maybe warmer or cooler. So there is the, the potential and the realized tree line are almost never in equilibrium. So that's my point. Whenever we say we do tree line research and we are going out in the European Alps to Northern Scandinavia, to Siberia, wherever we 
find a tree line, an upper or northward or poleward tree line, we have to be very uh, careful in not doing misinterpretations because whatever we see is a relict point in time. So what we did now for the first time, we reconstructed tree line dynamics. If we say the tree line is mainly induced by temperature and we now understand and can reconstruct temperatures for the past 2000 years. So you see here under B, this is our model or these are our reconstructions, 15 slightly different so very uh, uh, comparable temperature reconstructions for the common era for the past 2000 years. And then we can apply a lapse rate, a change of half a degree per 100 meter elevation. So if we go um, higher or, or uh, it's getting cooler or warmer. And then we have uh, to consider different three ages at, at the tree line ecotone. So we would say, if we go to a tree line, the trees are not all of the same age. Maybe they, they, they represent uh, uh, three ages between 300 and, uh, and 50 years. Then we have to consider under D a response time. So to, be, to become what we call a tree, something upright growing and interacting with the free atmosphere. So from a seedling and a sapling, it maybe needs up to 30 years. And then we would also say there is a difference, uh, 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 a likelihood to find more younger than older trees. Uh, so we have to uh, apply an age distribution. And what that enables us is to develop two reconstructions of, in gray, the potential tree line isotherm. So the conditions under which temperature uh, uh, a tree line could reach or change in elevation and in green, the realized tree line, the place where we're gonna find trees now. So as an example, to visualize that, if we are going into the Swiss Alps now, we see actually a realized tree line. So we see the upper tree line, but this tree line is today almost 250 meters below the potential tree line. So if the trees would be able to respond rapidly to a warming, they would be 250 years higher in elevation. So, and this here is now the green line, just I changed, uh, I adapted visually the scale here. So what we did, what we found is that over the past 2000 years, the tree line fluctuated about 45 to 50 meters in elevation. Uh, the tree line was higher around 100 to 200 years after the so-called uh, late Roman warm period. Then there was a sharp rise in the tree line following the mid sixth century cooling. So everything is lagged a little bit. Then we have relatively high tree line conditions uh, following the medieval warm period. But again, lagged by about 100 to 150 years. And then we have a depression of the tree line position into the so-called little ice age or little ice age type events. And then we have an increase in tree line, but we are still uh, below the um, potential tree line position. So the point here, the interesting point is that we have to go out and validate our model against relict tree line finds. So we can go around and see where were the tree line if we find remains to validate the model. Another interesting thing here is that comparative studies at the crossroads of archaeology, paleoclimatology, paleoecology, and history should consider temporal lacks in the response of vegetation and land use, land cover, forest resources, and carrying capacity following climatic trends. So we often say, oh, we have to look into a period and see how was the climate in order to make um, inferences about how it may or may not have affected ecosystems and societies. But this study nicely shows us that 
often if these things do not precisely coincide in time, this can be real because we have to consider these lags, lag effects in a, a slower response. I'm gonna skip this here. And another example or a way forward is if we want to study tree line dynamics, we actually should look into saplings and seedlings uh, that, that grow beyond the tree line. So they show much more dynamics. Last example, very quickly, annual resolution. So we are able to reconstruct Northern hemisphere summer temperatures with different sites uh, over the past 2000 years. All these reconstructions are highly resolved and absolutely dated. And this is only by annual resolution we have now the ability to compare, and not to explain, but just to compare, compare climate variability with human history. And this is my uh, thinking example here. How would our, our conceptual understanding about the volcano climate and human nexus look if, that's the example here, the Justinianic plague uh, started in 536. The coldest summer of the common era occurred in 540, and a cluster of large volcanic eruptions occurred between 541 and 548. So what does that mean? We had the outbreak of the first known large plague pandemic. A, like, a plague pandemic caused then an abrupt summer cooling over the Northern Hemisphere. And yes, everyone knows if it's very cold, then there will be a cluster of large volcanic eruptions. So it's absolute nonsense. Nothing makes sense. There wouldn't be any thinking about this nexus. So all I did here is I just changed the order of events by these years. So what we had, 536, a cluster of large volcanic eruptions. Then 540, 536 following, the coldest summers of the last 2,000 years, and 541 to 548, we have the establishment of the just and the outbreak and the establishment of the Justinianic plague. So this very small example here shows you how important it is that we have absolute dating precision if we want to investigate entanglements between climate and uh, human history, and if we want to compare natural and uh, and human um, documentary evidence, natural archives and human documentary evidence. The last example here, this is the oldest um, known um, settlement of the Vikings in North America. It dates to the year um, uh, 1021. So if we look now into our precise climate reconstructions, we see the Vikings successfully for the first time cross the Atlantic in the warmest summer of the last thousand years. Their settlement in Greenland coincide with the warmest year of the entire medieval period. Their first uh, occurrence uh, and first settlements on Iceland also follow a warm period. Their first known occurrence on the Faroe Islands uh, coincides with a very warm summer. And the first uh, archaeological evidence for large-scale Viking trade uh, also coincides with a warm period. So I'm not saying uh, I'm, I'm not saying anything here. I'm just comparing and showing you the data. So we went through these um, four examples. These are frontiers. This is where we are trying to improve the field and where we are also trying to contribute with new techniques, new data from the broader field of dendrochronology to ongoing research. So I hope I was able to show you um, or to demonstrate that tree ring research is not just only counting rings, that we can actually contribute to many environmental or natural uh, fields of the natural sciences. Thank you very much. I don't know what we are, are we now stopping to share the screen or what is- No, you can go on to your last, the last slide and then it's a reminder. And then everybody knows it there. Well, thank you very much. That was wonderful and so carefully explained. There's so much more in this than I than I imagined. Yes, I was in the Let's Come Treemings Brigade, I think. Okay, so I've, I've learned a great deal there. So while people are uh, mulling over questions to ask, 
Um, we have one already from your friend John Grace. Um, so I'm going to ask Julia if she can make it possible for John to speak and he can ask his own question because he says, do you agree? Discuss. So I think... Thank, thank you for, for the... Um for the question and and also thank you for uh, I, I know you uh you 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 had, you played a, a big role for this invitation here so I'm, I'm thankful for that and i apologize for, for not being able to to come up to edinburgh um yes in a tree leaves at the lower uh, canopy are limited by different factors i agree but the, the, now you talk about leaves and i i talked about the general in this case tree grows huh? I, Hello, can you, can you hear me? Yes, very well, yes. Can you even see me? I can see you, yes. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Yeah, I, I think Leibig's law is um, a simplification that was historically very useful in plant physiology. But um, these days, I, I, I don't think uh, we can call it a law uh, because, uh, well, spatially and temporally, uh, it doesn't apply. So you could imagine that um, a tree is limited by a different factor in the spring from uh, what it's limited by in the autumn. And the top of the canopy and the bottom of the canopy also um, will have different conditions. Uh, now, it doesn't mean that I don't believe in the approach you take. And I think that usually in these questions like the tree line question, there, there nearly always is an overriding uh, variable, but um, I, 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 I don't. I went, well, it's been some time since I taught plant physiology, but I used to tell my students that Liebig's law was just something which historically was useful, but um, it doesn't really it doesn't really hold as a law, and it's um, it's a generalization that um, can be useful in some contexts, but shouldn't be shouldn't be spread about too much these days. John, th thank you. And um, <laughs> I, I, I probably fully agree that, I mean, you know that we also, we are very classical and uh, uh, we, are, we are very critical with, with, with the life form classification. It's the same thing. It used to be very uh, useful back in the days. It's also an over uh, simplification. With, with Liebig's law, I'm, I'm not sure if he, what it to me what it says that there is always one factor limiting but the factor can change so when and your example saying look in the beginning or at the end of a growing season uh, uh, the, the factors may change but but what it what is important that one factor is enough to basically affect growth conditions we 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 we, we hopefully can uh, uh continue discussing that and I want to learn more at the next meeting uh, at Czech Globe. Yes, I think we could write a short paper about this, you know. <laughs> oh, that, 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 that would, okay. Makes sense. Thank Deal. you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, yes. I, make, I will make a note and I come back. Yes, yes. Because it's important. I think it's important. It's important to, to challenge these existing and I'm absolutely with you. If we call it a law, we have to be very, very careful on what does it apply? Is it still useful to do so? And if a, if a field uh, is moving forward, a community, and we, we should be able to question that and see what is the benefit in holding on it or, or questioning it. I, I'm, I'm with you there, yeah. Well, I can't see I can't see any other questions there. Thank you for answering. Oh, here it is uh, from Roy Thompson. Does your work help us with the tree ring divergence problem that Keith Griffer highlighted many years ago? He missed the start of the talk, so yeah, he's nope. apologizing yeah. if he missed yeah. it. Yeah, I, uh, I I knew Keith very well, and he was uh, he, he was such an important person for for the community. And um, we are still working on the divergence problem nowadays a lot, even more. So there was a period when when it, there was, was not a lot of attention to it. We do that now. Um, the tree line work or the example, that is the only figure I skipped a little bit, uh, partly relates to, to this topic. Um, but we also work 
now a lot in the Arctic where we have the feeling that uh, aerosols, so industrial uh, heavy uh, uh, pollutions are could be a, an explanatory factor for the divergence problem. Is that enough or I mean I, I could I could probably speak a week on, on this because that's relatively at the at the heart of our interest and it, it's still uh, posing a, a problem. yeah it's not fully um, resolved and, and Keith was the first one who found it actually in the Schweingruber network over Siberia yeah in ringwets more than in density. The problem is that the data they used back in the days they often st uh, stopped in the 80s and maximum early 90s. And now we have another 30 years to, to basically see is there still a divergence for those who don't know what it is. It means an inability of, of recent tree growth to track or of trees, tree growth to track the recent warming increase. Yeah. Thank you. Is that are you able to collect um, tree samples from all the melting glaciers and, and do they contribute to your study? Um, do yes. they help? It, it, it's, it's, a, it's very nice because it brings you in, in wonderful environment, but it's also time consuming. So you never know if there is something coming out in a certain year out of a certain glacier and it's, it's not a very core coordinated uh, tasks. So some groups in in the Swiss Alps, like there is a group in Innsbruck that does it uh, relatively systematically for several years. I myself from Cambridge, I'm not doing that so much. We, we yes, but but yes, we can. And I think that's an interesting one. If, if, if glaciers are retreating now, say in the European Alps, in the Swiss Alps and Austrian Alps, and we find wood, that is now the important point comes now that is in situ. So if we find basically a stem with the root system, basically it's a place where we assume the tree was growing and we can date this tree uh, at least with radiocarbon, but maybe even in an absolute chronology. And we found, we see uh, the, the tree is approximately 7,000 or 7,500 years old. So it, it dates somewhere in what we call the Holocene climate optimum. We have absolute evidence. So there's no, no doubt then anymore that at that time for a longer period of time, because these trees are maybe four or 500 years old, this part was ice free. So then there is absolute evidence. We know it then that the glaciers at that time, maybe 7,000 years ago, were for at least 1,000 years much smaller than they are now becoming. And so this is a very, very clear indicator, but it's not very systematically done. Can you use roots as, as well as stems and for, for doing the tree rings and, and will that help? It, it wouldn't really, it works. Yes, there are people working with roots. One, or the, there are groups that work on, that address geomorphological questions, like for instance, debris flow or erosion rates. And the roots can then play a role for dendrochron geomorphological work. There is a small, roots often contain a lot of reaction wood. And um, just for, 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 for the audience here, for the bot botanists, uh, you can distinguish if you have a stem section of, or, or, or a section, a disc from a stem and a root. The root has no pith, huh? but the, that doesn't affect the method. But yeah, just for, for the botanists to know, or the wood anatomist, so uh, a root has no pith. So we can actually see, and we can also see when a root became exposed to surface, uh, to the surface, then the anatomy, the wood anatomy is changing slightly and it becomes a stem. That's great. Um, uh, and one final question. Um, will this, the research that you've published recently, will it um, help the climate deniers or the climate um, change proponents? Will, it, will they be able to use your work to look at how it changes in the future and whether we should be more or less worried by the changes? I mean, a, a lot of, I wouldn't say motivation, but, 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 but 
I mean, the whole idea of, of, of studying paleoclimate, so understanding how the Earth's climate system has changed on different timescales, maybe also in different parts of the world, uh, in the past, in the pre-industrial period. I think that is that is highly informative to place the most recent trends and extremes in a long-term context of natural climate variability. We get a better sense about the dynamic, so it's never stable. I think this whole idea that for instance, let's make it concrete on, on, on something when, when people talk about the Paris Agreement, 1.5 degrees warmer than what? So then I'm, I'm very critical with this concept because there is no baseline, right? To what are warmer than what? And if we now see our data and also data from many other groups, there was no baseline. It was never stable. And, and then if we would move very far back in time, we then actually also you know that come in the glacial interglacial periods, but even if we stay in the Holocene in the last 12,000 years, different periods were characterized by different yeah, stages of the climate system. They were not that big, but what we see is these fluctuations year to year, multi-centennial have been induced by different forcing factors. And um, this is one thing we want to understand why is uh, the climate system so variable? So what are the forcing factors, the natural ones, beside greenhouse gases, so large volcanic eruptions, or maybe even a lot of small uh, eruptions, changes uh, in solar activity, and then on the longer time scales, and I showed that earlier with the isotopes, we are now getting even evidence for changes in orbital parameters. So this is important to then place that, not against, but relative to the effect of greenhouse gases. And there is one thing that often gets taken wrong if we are reconstructing past climate and we show more natural variability. Some people, but they don't understand it fully, they would say, ah, okay, you, you are able to show us that climate system was always varying. So where is the problem? Mm -hmm. And this is a wrong assumption. The assumption is that, the, that this only indicates that the climate system is very sensitive. So it's about the sensitivity. That means even without greenhouse gases, we had these fluctuations. We had cold and warm periods. So that means the earth, the sensitivity of the system is very high, which makes the uh, induction of green, so the uh, uh, the increase or, or the effect of greenhouse gases even bigger, right? So I think it is exactly the counter argument. It's if we are able to show that pre-industrial temperature and precipitation changes were relatively big, that only means that um, the additional uh, effect of greenhouse gases will be even further a problem. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, it was interesting to see how warm it appear, appeared to be in Roman times. And you think, oh, well, there was the Roman Empire and it was warmer in Roman times. And the, Ro the Roman. And then, and then, they, then they fell away, then they, they declined. So it, it's, it's a difficult. It's yes. The Roman one is a difficult. We are now trying to get a relatively good feeling about the medieval one, but we need another thousand years, I would say for the Roman one, because what our best records are now 2000 years long. So mm -hmm. they, they start, and that's where they are the weakest, right? At the beginning of the record. And that is exactly during Roman time. So in so so that's interesting. For a long time, our records covered thousand years, more or less. And then there was always the, the debate about the medieval warm versus the little ice age and the recent warming. Now we added another thousand years, so we have two thousand years that helps us to get the medieval period relatively good. So that means if we want to understand that is what we want to do next, understand Roman conditions, we actually need a record that goes back to Bronze Age, right? Mm -hmm. so to get the start. But 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 that that's the ambition, yeah, to yeah. to get more dots on the map. So basically, to increase the spatial, the raster, the grid, to to understand climate in different parts of the world and to understand it long or reconstruct it longer back in time. Well, that was that's fascinating. Well, thank you so much for the your talk and for spending the time and answering the questions. Um, I Pleasure. think it, um, it's past seven o'clock, so I guess we should let you go. 
And um, I look forward to listening to your talk actually again when it's because it's being recorded, we we'll, can easily go through it again. So thank you very much for your time. That was wonderful. Thank you for the invitation again. And uh, I apologize for not being with you in person. It would have been nice, but but maybe that is also now the chance to get a second invitation in a couple yes. of years. And I would love to come out to, to Edinburgh. Okay. Yes, there's, there's plenty of people you could come and meet. Yeah, I, I would have loved to. Okay, thank yes. you. Thank you very much. And okay. thanks to the audience and the participants. I couldn't see them, but I saw at one point there were more than 40 or around 40 people. Yes joining in, which is nice. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, I'll let you close it down now. Okay, bye -bye. I'm leaving. Bye-bye, bye. -bye, bye.